Welcome to Approximation Algorithms and the lecture on rounding data and dynamic programming. My name is Rasmus Pei. Today we are going to talk about rounding problems to make them feasible. We are going to look at two case studies, scheduling parallel jobs where we go from a 2 approximation to a 1 plus epsilon approximation and bin packing. First, let's recall the problem that we considered last time. We need, want to schedule jobs of different durations P1 through Pn, all non-negative, on M machines. The goal is to optimize the make span, that is the total time to finish all jobs. Last time, we looked at a local search algorithm and showed that it gave a 2 approximation. Today, instead, we are going to look at a different approach, a greedy approach that works by processing the longest jobs first. Without loss of generality, we can assume that P1 is the longest, P2 the second longest, and so on. Any feasible solution has some job that finishes last. So in general, a schedule can look, could look something like this. And let's say it's M2 that finishes last. And let's call that last job J, and it has processing time PJ. It's easy to see that when job J started, all machines must have been busy. Why? Well, because otherwise job J would have been started earlier. So there can be no idle time before this. What do we know about the period in which there's no idle time? Well, it's at least the average processing time, sum of pi over m, which is a lower bound on opt, as we saw last time. So if pj is less than epsilon times opt, we actually have already an 1 plus epsilon approximation. So somehow short jobs are easier. We're going to define t as the average processing time and split the jobs into the easy ones and the difficult ones. So in particular, the ones that have processing time less than t over k for some parameter k, we call them short, and the ones that have longer processing time, we call long. And k we're going to choose as something like 1 over epsilon. Now I'd like you to pause and think. Why is it that there can be at most m times k long jobs? And secondly, how many ways can we schedule the set of long jobs? Now the algorithmic idea is to first handle the difficult part of the problem, the long jo jobs. We first schedule the long jobs either optimally or at least nearly so. Then we schedule the short jobs in descending order uh, with the greedy me uh, mechanism. So there are two cases to consider. First of all, if the last job to finish is short, I claim that we're done. Why is that? Well, the cost is at most optimum plus the length of the shortest job, which by definition was optimum over k at most, because of the lower bound on opt. The other case, the last job to finish is long. Then the cost is actually the same as if there were no short jobs at all. So it must equal opt, and we're done. To implement this algorithm, we need to consider all possible ways of scheduling the long jobs. This gives a running time of something like O of m to the km, which is a bound on the number of configurations of the long jobs. The question is, can we do better when m is large? We are going to show that the answer is yes. To this end, we redefine t. So now t is simply an upper bound that we assume is known on opt. 
and the goal now is to find a schedule with make span at most 1 plus 1 over k times t. So if t is a reasonably tight upper bound, that is gives us an approximation algorithm. So now short jobs are defined with respect to t as before. To get better running time, we are going to round. So we are going to round pi down to the nearest multiple of t over k squared. So this means that there is at most k squared possible lengths because we know that all jobs have length at most t, since t is an upper bound on opt. And now we claim that we can schedule, find a schedule for the long jobs using dynamic programming. How do we do this? There are a couple of observations. First of all, there can be at most k jobs per machine in a schedule of length at most t. That's because all the jobs are long, without lots of generality. Since there are only k squared possible job lengths, an arbitrary input to the problem can be described by a vector of length k squared, saying how many jobs there are of each length. We define opt n1 through n k squared as the smallest number of machines needed to execute a workload with max make span at most t. Such an optimal schedule must consist of assigning jobs to one machine in some way and then assigning jobs optimally to the others. In other words, its value is equal to 1 plus the minimum over all ways of assigning jobs to one machine of the opt of the job that remains after assigning to one machine. So this gives a recurrence that we can use for dynamic programming. And we can compute this bottom up by looking at the sum of the ni. So first compute all inputs with zero elements, one element, and so on, up to. And at some point, we are going to reach the opt for the true input configuration, and we are done. So the final thing we need to discuss is how to find t. t needs to be an upper bound on opt, but it needs to be pretty close. So one easy solution is just to try t equals to 1 through 2, 3, and so on. There's a smarter choice, which is described in the book. So what do we end up with? Well, the final algorithm runs in time n to f of k, where k determines the approximation quality. And we can make the approximation arbitrarily good, arbitrarily close to uh, 1 by increasing k. So this means that we have a so-called polynomial time approximation scheme. However, the time does grow exponentially with the choice of epsilon if we want approximation factor 1 plus epsilon. Later in the course, we are going to see fully polynomial time approximation schemes, where the running time depends polynomially on n as well as 1 over epsilon. In the next part of the lecture, we are going to look at the bin packing problem. In this problem, the input is a set of numbers in the range 0 to 1, and the objective is to choose an assignment of the indices 1 through n, so that is assign these numbers to m bins such that m is minimized and such that in each bin the elements sum to a number less than or equal to 1. As it's phrased, it's actually hard to find a good approximation algorithm. It's np-hard to distinguish the two cases where it's possible to pack all the items into exactly two bins of weight 1, and the case where you need three bins. This means that a three-half approximation is the best we could hope to get unless p equals np. But actually, we can almost get an approximation scheme in the following sense. So for every epsilon larger than 0, we can pack into a number of bins, which is 1 plus epsilon times the opt, plus a constant that depends on epsilon. And we can do this in polynomial time. The first observation is that, in a certain sense, 
small items, that is items of size less than epsilon, do not matter. So we can assume without loss of generality that the items are ordered such that the largest items come first. Let's call the items of size less than epsilon small. Now the observation is that we can simply place these items last. So let's suppose we have all placed all the items except an. Where can we possibly place an, the smallest item? So let's look at a configuration. So we have partially fin filled uh, a number of bins. Now there are two cases for placing an. Either some bin has spare capacity epsilon, where an is, is small. This means that an simply fits in one of the bins and the number of bins doesn't increase. The other case is that no bin has spare capacity epsilon. So we need a new bin. So we now have to create a new bin and place an in it. Now I would like you to pause and think. Why do we still have a solution in this case that is close to the optimal in, in case two, even though we have to add an extra bin? So using this reasoning, we can practically ignore all the small items and take care of them greedily in the end. So it basically suffices to solve the problem in the case where all the elements a1 through an have length at least epsilon half. To solve the problem in the case where all items are large, we're going to do discretization via grouping. So consider all the elements here in sorted order. It could look something like this. What we're going to do is to group them into groups each containing k elements. So we're going to define a new input that we can solve more easily and whose value or the solution to which actually gives us a good solution to the original problem. So the new input is basically a copy of the previous one, but in each group we round up the values to the maximum in the group. So a1, a2, a3 get a new value that's equal to a1. a4, 5 and 6 get a value that's equal to a4 and so forth. Also we drop the largest group, so we simply throw these elements away. This gives us a new input i prime, and let's call the original input i. It's easy to see that by definition i prime has only n over k distinct values. And this means that we can actually use the scheduling algorithm that we saw before. So using dynamic programming, when we only have a small number of distinct values, we can actually find uh, a 1 plus epsilon approximation efficiently. We claim that the Solution to i prime actually tells us something useful about the solution to i. So in particular, the solution to i prime is has value that is less than or equal to opt, but it's not too far from opt of i. So it exceeds or it's it's less than opt i by at most k. So let's argue for these two inequalities one by one. For the first one, we want to argue that if we're given a solution to i, we can get a solution to i prime that has at most the same cost. So why is that? Well, the largest element in i prime is smaller than the largest element in i, second largest is smaller than the second largest, and so on. So basically, we can mirror any uh, solution uh, from i to i prime. For the second inequality, given a solution to i prime, we claim that we can get a solution to i with additional cost at most k. And this additional cost simply consists of putting the largest k items in one bin, 
Now we can do a mirroring similar to before. Why is that? Well, it's basically because the size or the vector of the remaining jobs is dominated by the vector of jobs in I prime. So it's easy to see that we can just maintain the same ordering of the elements in the item and we get in the in the assignment and we get a new valid solution that has the same number of uh, bins uh, apart from the k first. So finally, we choose k to be epsilon times the sum of all of the i's, which is at most epsilon times opt, and that gives us a solution that is, has the required value.